my name is John Godfrey, and uh, I chair the Wallenberg Executive Committee here at the University of Michigan. I am very pleased to welcome you this evening, and I'm also pleased to welcome uh, uh, our friends and uh, fellow uh, students and faculty at the University of Michigan, Flint, who are seeing this evening's uh, uh, medal presentation and lecture uh, on uh, remote video. So we're pleased this is the first time we've been able to do this. Uh, Eighty years ago, uh, this very evening, Raoul Wallenberg sat in his room on Haven Avenue writing a letter to his grandfather. He used a borrowed typewriter and wrote in English since his machine with its accented Swedish vowels had been sent out for repair and he had borrowed one from a friend. Haven Avenue, where Wallenberg wrote his October 1932 letter, is no more. That block, lined with student boarding houses, once ran north from Hill Street through the land on which the Ross School of Business now stands. For Raoul, who was now in his second year, this was a good location, a, half, a short half block from Lorch Hall where his architecture classes met, and on fall mornings, a quick walk brought him to the Michigan Union for breakfast where he had discovered the delights of the American grapefruit with his coffee. And from his room, it was only two blocks north to the East Physics Building, now also gone, where he suffered in his physics class. What he described to his grandfather as he wrote that evening, as a very hard subject and far removed from what I call a pleasant pastime. A quick walk up the Diag and Raoul reached the old German restaurant on Washington Street for dinner or the pretzel bell on Liberty where after prohibition was repealed a year later, he was finally able to buy beer legally. The University of Michigan was far more intimate in October 1932, with just under 9,000 students, including 220 students who, like Wallenberg, came from overseas. He certainly adjusted quickly to undergraduate life in a great American public university. As he confided to his grandfather that night, I don't know whether it is the character of an adventurer that shines through but I take a particular pride or pleasure in relaxing for a week or two in order to get time to do what I like and then suddenly pull myself together and work a whole night or so, which gives you a little more of a thrill than just keeping to your everyday tasks. He had discovered the all-nighter and its advantages. <laughs> that character of an adventurer still glowed that October evening with the experience of his previous summer when, at the age of 19, he had hitchhiked to Chicago where he visited his friend John Wehausen, who was a brilliant engineering student, and then set out on adventure along Route 66 to Los Angeles. He wore his ROTC uniform because, as he explained to his grandfather, drivers are more likely to stop for someone hitching a ride in uniform. We can see that uniform in a photograph taken of him posing confidently at the side of the Bear Mountain Bridge over the Hudson River in New York on his way to visit relatives in Connecticut. In another of the few photographs we have of him while he was a Michigan student, he is also in costume, this time dressed as Ali Baba, adjusting his turban for the annual Architects Ball just before he graduated in 1935. In many ways, Raoul Wallenberg's adventure began here, in a university that opened doors for him that would have remained shut had he stayed in Sweden. In order to take advantage of what he found in Ann Arbor, he disguised himself. None of even his closest friends knew that Rudy, as he was called, came from one of Sweden's wealthiest and most powerful families. He was a brilliant student, but with the freedom to find his own path away from the burdens of family expectations, he became a brilliant adventurer, an adventurer of the world that Michigan opened up for him. As he sat in his room 80 years ago and hunted for keys in unfamiliar locations to type his letter, we can look for the faint threads that fell forward to only 12 years later 
when, in an unimagined city of horror on the Danube, Raoul Wallenberg reached into his past to the character of an adventurer to find the determination, the audacity, the resourcefulness, and fearlessness he needed to help save the surviving Jews of Budapest. He organized artists and printers to fabricate colorful and imposing Schutzpass, protective passports, which fancifully but effectively declared the bearer to be under Swedish protection and immune from arrest or detention. He dressed young Jewish men in SS uniforms and sent them to bring Jews to the safety zones that he declared to be under Swedish authority. Raoul Wallenberg made himself into an imposing, larger-than-life figure who intimidated Nazi officers and their Hungarian fascist allies. His inventive audacity in the moment of greatest danger saved the lives of thousands and made possible the lives of their descendants. This year is the centenary of Raoul Wallenberg's birth. He was a part of our university and is one of its most illustrious and renowned graduates. In addition to this evening's medal and lecture, to celebrate this year, the university will host an exhibit about Raoul Wallenberg and his life, which has been organized by the Swedish Foreign Ministry and the Swedish Institute. It will be on display in the Michigan Union starting January 30th in a beautiful room on the ground floor, past which Raoul Wallenberg hurried to have his coffee and breakfast grapefruit before his classes began just 80 short years ago. To introduce our honored speaker this evening, I am very pleased to invite to the stage Philip Hanlon, Arthur F. Thurnau, and Donald J. Lewis, Collegiate Professor of Mathematics and Provost and Executive Vice President for Ac Academic Affairs of the University of Michigan. Well, thank you, John, and good, e good evening to everyone. Uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be here tonight and have a, a small role in conferring the Raoul Wallenberg Medal on Marie Ganell. As John mentioned, Raoul Wallenberg was a man of great courage who committed himself to the protection of others. We are proud of our connection to him at the University of Michigan, and we're pleased to honor his life and work. We recognize his contributions to the world with a sculpture outside the Art and Architecture Building on North Campus, a plaque in Lorch Hall, which was the Architecture Building in the 1930s, the Wallenberg Travel Scholarship, which provides summer support to students doing humanitarian work in other countries, and with the annual presentation of the Wallenberg Medal. It's an honor to introduce Marie Ganneau, the 2012 recipient of the Wallenberg Medal. Ms. Gano grew up in Boone County, West Virginia. From early days, her family taught her to appreciate and connect to the land, a culture that's prevailed in Boone County for generations. Her community is oriented to the land as they hunt, fish, and gather food and medicinal plants. This way of life is threatened by mountaintop removal mines that disrupt and destroy local ecosystems. Boone County is in central Appalachia, an area rich in coal. The coal industry drives the local economy, providing jobs to many, including members of Ms. Gano's family. Now we may think, we may often think, of coal miners as working in deep shafts below the ground. But in recent years, many coal companies have begun using the mountaintop removal approach instead. The process involves clear cutting the mountaintop and then blasting about 800 feet off the mountain so that they can access the coal seams directly. The, the environmental effects of this process can be devastating. Rubble from the mountaintop, which often contains toxic debris, is dumped into nearby valleys where it pollutes rivers and streams. Missing both foliage and layers of soil, the mountains cannot retain water, causing floods in the valleys. In 2000, a mountaintop removal mine was established on the ridge above Miss Gano's home. Since then, there have been seven floods of her property, 
something that had not happened before in memory. Her yard has been covered with toxic sludge, her well and groundwater contaminated, and her ancestral home was destroyed. In 2004, Ms. Gano realized that she had to act, that she needed to do what she needed to do what she could to make a difference. She volunteered with local organizations and then began working for the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition. Her goal was to educate her neighbors about the environmental effects of mountaintop mining so that they too could come and help stop the destruction of their community. Ms. Gano has trained many others in work such as reading and monitoring mining permits, writing to elected officials and the media, monitoring coal companies, reporting toxic spills, and testifying to governmental bodies. Committed to nonviolent methods, she's empowering her community to exercise its right to a voice in a decision that affects it dearly. There have been repeated acts of intimidation against Ms. Gano and others involved in this work. These include threats on her life, harassment of her children, and the publication of wanted posters that feature her picture. Yet, Ms. Gano perseveres. She's testified in court hearings that have led to injunctions stopping new mining activities in Boone County. This past June, she testified before the U.S. House of Representatives in support of the Federal Clean Water Protection Act. She's working with a coalition of groups in Appalachia to bring renewable energy businesses and jobs to the region, providing a beacon of hope for many communities. In activities that stretch from the local to the national, Ms. Gano is demonstrating how much difference one person can make in the world. Her work on specific policies and regulations makes an immediate difference to communities in West Virginia. Her dedication to educating and empowering others will have a lasting impact, ensuring that the voices of citizens are heard at all levels of government. Ms. Gano is an inspiring example of Raoul Wallenberg's belief in the power of an individual to affect change in the world. The University of Michigan is proud to present her with the 2012 Wallenberg Medal. Ms. Gano, please join me. I am deeply honored that my work has been recognized by the University of Michigan in such a wonderfully inspiring way. I am humbled to be in the company of such an amazing person as Raul Wallenberg. It is the history of this work, of the human rights work, that allowed me to believe in real change beginning at the grassroots. Our struggles will only benefit the next generation if each generation continues to demand better for future generations. Our work will never truly be done, only celebrated in the lives we live and the lives we leave behind to carry on the message that we are all one person, and this one person's name is humanity. Thank you to the university, of Michigan community, my family and friends and supporters in Appalachia, and of course, Raul Wallenberg for inspiring future generations of human rights activists. There's not enough room up here, excuse me. <laughs> The destruction of the mountains and the people, the destruction of the mountains and the removal of the people from the Appalachian, from Appalachia for coal. Uh, what is mountaintop removal? That's the big question. Most people have in their mind, they have no idea what mountaintop removal is. As you can see, 
Mountaintop removal is the total destruction of a mountain and all that surrounds it. For the seams of coal that lay within the layers of rock, to date, there's been more than 500 mountains destroyed and over 2,000 miles of streams buried or otherwise impacted. The people are often the last to leave. Uh, the community that you see in the foreground is, the name of that community is Lindy Town. Uh, the New York Times covered the disappearance of Lindy Town. Uh, Lindy Town no longer exists. In 2009, the coal company bought up the houses and depopulated the town. The layers of rock are blasted into rubble. The coal is extracted and everything that remains is dumped into adjacent valleys, making up what the industry calls valley fields. This was once a headwater stream of the Coal River Valley. And if you notice, there's, uh, the equipment on this site has 11 feet tires. I can stand inside of the tires. That will give you a sense of, of scale. Uh, the Coal River Valley is the valley that I live in. Uh, it, it's the headwaters of the Ohio River, which is the headwaters of the Mississippi. Uh, mountaintop removal is impacting the drinking water of citizens throughout the southeastern United States. We're all downstream. We all have the responsibility and obligation to protect these water resources. This is the commons. This belongs to the people. Why would government create law laws to allow these places and people who de depend on them to be erased forever? This is Pigeon Roost Holler. This is a stream nearby where we live at. This is the headwaters of the water throughout the eastern United States. This is what used to be a natural spring that runs along the bottom of a mountain. This water is now toxic. It's too toxic to breathe, let alone drink. What is left to sustain water or sustain life if we have no healthy water? We will die. Coal sludge is a waste product produced by washing coal with water and chemicals prior to shipping the coal to the market. Every preparation plant where they wash and prepare coal produces many thousand gallons of coal sludge each day, requiring massive disposal areas. Most sludge disposed of above ground in toxic lakes is called impoundments. Not only do these facilities often leach and cause black water spills uh, into our streams, there have been several catastrophic failures resulting in toxic floods, massive property destruction, and even death. And to, there's a newspaper clipping uh, on this slide, and that newspaper clipping is a clipping from where my aunt and my, my cousin uh, died in one of these Blackwater, uh, one of these pond failures. It happened in Bull Creek. This is a Blackwater spill. This is uh, in the stream that runs by my home. This is, again, the headwaters of the eastern United States. People drink this water. EPA guidelines for conductivity for water are three to 500 microsiemens. Streams around mountaintop removal test high. Here, more than 1,800. My stream that runs through our property tested 1,200. And that, that measures the heavy metal content in the water, so you know. Coal sludge pollutes our streams and wells and threatens our safety and well-being in our homes. As you can see, the coal sludge here is going straight into the streams. There's, no, um, it, there's nothing to stop it. The coal companies are allowed to use our streams as their, their pollution uh, spillways. The coal industry has hundreds of sludge dams dotted throughout our mountains. In February of 1972, a sludge dam on Buffalo Creek in Logan County <clears throat> gave way unleashing a torrent of thick, murky water that claimed 118 lives, left seven people missing, and destroyed hundreds of homes, leaving thousands of people homeless, including entire families that were members of my family. This is my home uh, before and after the flooding of 2003. 
Failed sediment controls dams caused this flooding, much like what happened with Buffalo Creek. I've since been flooded nine times. A slurry injection is something that the coal companies are doing in our areas. And it's when they run out of room in their impoundments to store their sludge, they pump it into underground aquifers, or I'm sorry, underground abandoned mines, and it ends up in our aquifers. In Boone County alone, we have 16 to 20 injection sites pumping millions of gallons per minute into our aquifers, and this is coal sludge going into our drinking water. This makes people sick. This is the water uh, in the tanks, uh, the toilet tanks of the people nearby where we live. This is what heavy metal does to the water resources in southern Appalachia. And in some cases, this is people's only drinking water. This is all they have. Heavy metal stains in the bathtubs is real common throughout southern Appalachia. This is what coal does to water. The coal waste in water settles in the water heaters. Your water may come, the water may come from the faucet clear, so you naturally drink it. These same solids, though, end up in the human body, causing fatal health problems. This is what my water does to, my, to the insides of my faucets, faucets. I have replaced these about every six months or they completely close off. I purchase all of the water we consume by the gallon. <clears throat> well water and entire aquifers are polluted by coal waste and this makes people sick. Can cancer is as common as the cold in Appalachia. Chemicals found in coal sludge. Now, I won't try to pronounce these. Uh, that, that's beyond my uh, skills. Uh, but yeah, when we ask the coal industry, what's in this stuff? What's in coal sludge? They look at, they have the answer of, uh, it's a trade secret. What's in coal sludge is a trade secret. But yet they're pumping their trade secret into our drinking water and it's killing us. In 2007, Jupiter Coal Company used World War II uh, munition igniters on the mine site behind me. And it, they were in storage because they was too toxic for war. Uh, so they quit using them in war and decided that the Department of Defense and the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection and Jupiter Coal Company decided to dispose of these uh, munitions above my home, 3,500 feet from my home. As you can see, the arrow clearly points to where my home sets at. Uh, the photo in the top right, that's my barn. Uh, the, if you look in the horizon behind my barn, that's how close the blasting is to my home. This photo was actually an accident. Um, but yeah, it, it, that's how close they are to my home. And the photo on the bottom, that, that's how the dust, I mean, it, it falls on our homes uh, it, just as if it were fog moving through the valley. I mean, and, and at times you cannot see from one side of the valley to the other, the dust is so thick. And this mine site behind me is 1183 acres. Uh, the air pollution from mountaintop removal coal mining is heavily polluted with particulates that are known to cause cancer. There's silica and coal dust and chemicals used in these explosives, and they're being found in our homes and our bodies. An ever-growing number of peer-reviewed health research reports prove that mountaintop removal, the associated water pollution and air pollution is killing people that live near these mine sites. You can find these health studies at ohvec.org and just to highlight a few of them, chronic cardiovascular disease, mortality in mountaintop removal and mountaintop mining areas of central Appalachian states. Uh, higher coronary heart disease and heart attack morbidity in Appalachian coal mining regions. Lung cancer mortality is elevated in coal mining areas of Appalachia. There's now 23 of these health studies, peer-reviewed health studies that's been released. Insults are the only way the coal industry lawyers have to respond to the health research. Lawyers from Firm, Kroll, and Mooring are 
from the firm Kroll and Mooring are attacking the latest studies by Melissa Ahern and West Virginia's University Michael Hendricks, indicating that people who live near mountaintop removal operations face a greater risk of birth defects. But the internet posting from our, from four of our of the firm's lawyers was well. Here's what it said: the study failed to account for consanguinity one of the most prominent sources of birth defects. That's what the attorney said. Well, I had to look this one up. And consanguinity means that of blood relation refers to property, refers to the property of being of the same kinship. In other words, the industry attorneys, the only way that they have responded is by saying that our health problems was being caused by inbreeding. This was taken from my home in Bob White. This is a plume of dust that, ri dust that rises from the blasting and settles in our homes and in our, in our bodies. Uh, th this, uh, th th they prepared for this blast for four days. And, and when they set it off, I was prepared to capture it. Um, and it's also available online. It's, I cut this out of a, out of a video. <clears throat> Excuse me. West Virginia air pollution at mountaintop removal mines may cause heart problems. Adult male rats were exposed to the air particles, and 24 hours following the exposure, their blood vessels' ability to dilate and function normally was significantly reduced. And that's an article that was in the State Journal, and that's a very cold friendly. A newspaper in the state of West Virginia. <clears throat> and even our dead do not rest in peace. This is Twilight Surface Mines. This is 25 square miles of nothing but blown up rock and poison water. And you'll notice uh, in the foreground, uh, well, there's three arrows you can see. It points to the cemeteries that is tangled up in this mess of destruction. Uh, these are World War II, World War I, all world wars. Uh, there's, soldiers are buried in these cemeteries that fought for my rights to go to these, those cemeteries and visit them. And the coal companies won't let us. If we go, we have to wear boots and a hard hat. We are supervised. Um, we're limited on how long we can be there. And we have to take safety training. Mine Safety and Health Administration says that we have to take safety training to go to our cemeteries. The tactics of the coal industry is much like it was 150 years ago. This is a scanned page of our children's history book. It says in reference to surface mining, in some instances that the land is left in better than before condition. One local 12-year-old, uh, one local 12-year-old child was asked to do a report on surface mine reclamation and he was failed because he couldn't come up with anything positive to say about it. His ancestral cemetery is, is one of the ones that I just showed you, and it's inaccessible. He can't get to it, and uh, he, he, he's not going to say anything positive about it. Um, the coal curriculum called Unfit for Fourth Graders, this was in the New York Times. You can Google this and find it. Uh, the activity included getting chocolate chip cookies out of chocolate or chocolate chips out of chocolate chip cookies with minimal damage. That was one of the activities. Uh, it, the, the title of this is called United States of Energy and it was a scholastic curriculum that they was going to teach fourth graders. And it, it, uh, there was three groups, Rethinking Schools, the Campaign for Commercial Free Childhood, and Friends of Earth worked to have this taken out of scholastic curriculum using our grassroots work as an example of why it should be taken out. Uh, Patriot Coal, currently, is attempting to file bankruptcy on 22,000 coal miners' health and retirement benefits. This will impact thousands of our local people. Generations of West Virginia coal miners have dedicated their careers to making Patriot and the entire coal industry a, a success. 
These employees and retirees have spent decades working hard under promise of fair wages, safe working conditions, and secure pension and lifetime health care benefits. I am therefore troubled that Patriot has indicated that this reviewing that it is reviewing pension and health care benefits as potential source of savings as it restructures, especially all of these benefits were contractually agreed to uh, or voluntarily assumed by Patriot. That was words from Senator Jay Rockefeller to the pa Patriot CEO. And, and what's going on there is um, there's literally there's men in my community that that are being denied health care uh, because this company is um, they, they want to skip out on the health and retirement funds and some of these men has worked as, has worked as long as 40 years in the coal mines and they're gonna walk away on them Appalachia and her people are not a lost cause and we will not leave our ancestral homes we were here long before coal was discovered, and we are fighting to end mountaintop removal now. The community, the, the quotes here are from community members that were the last holdouts in communities. And this is Quinny Richmond from the town of Lindytown that was destroyed. She says, we gotta fight every day for everything, but at the end of the day, it's worth it all. We're still home. Why should we be sacrificed for the wealth of Wall Street? Why should we have to pay with all evidence that we ever existed? It isn't, is it because we're hillbillies? Or is it because the coal industry thinks we're stupid hillbillies? That was Larry Gibson. We lost Larry Gibson on September the 9th of cardiac failure. We've grown from small town hall meetings with only a few attendees into a national movement. We demand an end to the abuses of people of Appalachia and our human rights. We deserve a life with health, with healthy land, clean water, clean air, security in our homes, and clean, sustainable energy, for a clean, sustainable energy future for our children. We have had major actions with thousands of supporting members and member organizations, hundreds of arrests for nonviolent civil disobedience. We all know the organization I work for now owns property with 20 feet of coal underneath it in the town of Twilight to stop the depopulation of this town. If you'll notice the mountaintop removal is moving towards where the, the yellow pin is. And um, our, that's where our property sits. And the OVEC, the organization I work for, uh, now owns property that's stopping the expanding mountaintop removal. And this was the idea of an underground union coal miner who was a former organizer, organizer in our community. And this was his property. We organized locally and nationally to win a new school for the kids in Sundial, West Virginia. In 2013-2014 school year, the children will be attending a new school upstream from the sludge dam, prep plant, and mountaintop removal operation. If you'll notice where the arrow points, there is a schoolyard there. The school's been there for 40 years, longer than 40 years now, and the coal company built uh, the, the preparation plant, which you can see at the lower corner, and then they um, put the 2.8 billion gallons of coal sludge behind an elementary school, and then they started blasting behind all of that. Uh, it, this is an elementary school full of children. There's been three, uh, three teachers that has taught at that school that has died of cancer. Uh, the, the kids, when they would go to school, would be sick. When they'd come home, they'd get better. Uh, and, and the kids brought our attention to this. The children came to us and said, hey, we're, that, that coal mine's making us sick. And it, that's listening is a very important aspect of my work. We filed lawsuit to force the companies to clean up their selenium pollution in our streams, and we won. Because of victories, because of our victories, we've been under violent attack by the industry supporters, including our own politicians. 
Senator Joe Manchin. This is our West Virginia State Senator, and his quote in his latest campaign uh, commercial is, I will take on anyone who tries to stop us. And I wonder, does he know that it's West Virginia citizens standing in his way? And yes, this firearm and his uh, gun rhetoric is a part of his commercial. October the 17th, 2012, we filed another lawsuit to force regulatory agencies to consider the health impacts of mountaintop removal in their permit process. Well, the OVEC uh, was lead plaintiff in filing lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers for their permits and for not considering the health in their permits. <coughs> Excuse me. We are holding our ground and we need your help. We have recently introduced a bill to end mountaintop removal, specifically because of the health impact and the impact of, and the health impact of our um, unborn. The Ake Act, it's HR 5959, calls for an immediate moratorium on all new mountaintop removal mining permits and no expansion for existing mountaintop removal permits. 14 congressional representatives introduced, this, introduced the AKE Act. Please help support and follow this bill at the AKEact.org. Contact your state congressional representatives and find out if they've signed on to support the AKE Act, and if not, ask them to do so. And please join us in our struggle to save all that is Appalachia. See OVEC.org. Thank you. Uh, of course, as usual, we have a lot of time uh, for conversation with you, for questions and answers uh, from Maria. She's generously agreed to this. And we have a couple of microphones <clears throat> in the front, so if anyone would like to ask Maria a question about her work, uh, please step forward. In Michigan, we have a proposal, a citizen's referendum on the ballot that would force the use of renewable energy, 25% of our energy should be renewable. Some people have been concerned that it would be enshrined in our state constitution, um, but it has recently been learned that one of our major power companies, maybe the major power company, DTE, has a for-profit coal subsidiary. and. That has certainly changed my mind, and I definitely intend to vote for it. I guess I'm giving a little political message here. But I'm wondering if you would comment on renewable energy. Renewable energy is, is we must, we must. Uh, USGS says we're running out of coal. Uh, they said four years ago that we had 25 years of mineable coal left. We have to transition. We don't have a choice. Our children's well-being and, and uh, the future uh, of uh, our world depends on, on transitioning to renewable energy. Hello, Mi hello, Ms. Gunnell. Uh, thank you for coming out to the university. Uh, my name is Sean, and I'm speaking on behalf of Students for Clean Energy. Um, the uh, University of Michigan is seen as a very clean university, however we get 97% of our energy from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So my question is how do you change the perception that an organization is sustainable? Hey, you're, you're talking about the fossil fuel industry? Well, I mean, in your case, um, our club actually just saw yesterday your, your uh, movie, uh, The Last Mountain. Okay. And a lot of the uh, coal companies um, publicly say that they're being clean and sustainable, as, as you addressed earlier. However, um, you, you need to campaign and um, 
let other people know that what they're actually doing is not is is very is hurting the environment and not clean at all. So it's it's propaganda. The co industry uh, spends a tremendous well, the energy industries, not just the co industry, uh, spends a tremendous amount of money misinforming people. Uh, clean coal technology is is a blatant lie. Uh, it, it, there is no such thing as clean coal. Uh, none. It's uh, it's a it, it's a Pretty words is what that is. Uh, and the industry thinks, well, quite honestly, industry, government, they all think that we're uh, robots that can be programmed into believing everything that comes out of their mouths. And, and uh, in order to uh, clean up coal, they have to start at the extraction process. And it, it, when they're blowing up mountains in Appalachia for coal, it don't really care, you know, it doesn't matter what comes out of the top of the coal-fired power plants. Uh, it's it, the entire process with coal mining, uh, underground and surface coal mining, is killing people. Uh, there, there's men that die in the mines every day, and it, we, we are so far beyond this. You know, I mean, it, in society today, we can make energy that don't kill people, and it's time for our government to get on board of doing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi. Um, you actually just answered. I was going to ask you to address the idea of clean coal because it's yeah. making such a national news, and it's like, hmm. Um, I, I recently read the book, um, uh, sorry, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, um, mm -hmm. and it talks about Southern Appalachian, the coal mining industry. And it, it's interesting because it sounds like some of the pushback in the region is coming from people who feel that they're losing jobs because of people like yourself. And I'm curious what your take on it is being in that situation. Like, um, is the intimidation, do you feel strictly coming from coal miners or is the propaganda just very effective that, the, that there's a lot of people who feel like you're the cause of them losing jobs? Does that make right. sense? Um, the coal industry is actually costing themselves jobs. Uh, you know, mechanization has replaced more jobs than environmental law uh, ever will. In 1960, we had 125,000 coal miners in the state of West Virginia. Today, we have less than 15,000. Uh, and the, uh, the reason for that is uh, mechanization. Uh, they've, uh, they have massive drag lines uh, that have uh, yeah, well, the bucket on a drag line will hold three Greyhound buses, so uh, that's how big that is. <laughs> and and uh, it, drag lines, a friend of mine, Judy Bonds, always said drag lines can't organize. They don't shop in our communities. They don't go to our schools, you know, and, and they're no liability for the companies, and that's the reason I'd rather have drag lines than men. Uh, the industry has done away with more jobs than what environmental regulation ever will. It's hard to see, you know, people who are willing to uh, create industries that do this. Yeah. And your sadness in uh, your descriptions, I, it touches me very much. Um, the owners and the high officials of the companies, where do they live? Mm -hmm. They certainly must come in and out and, and see what it is, but I'm just curious about their home personal. Oh, most homes. of my opposition drives through our communities. They don't live in our communities, so you're right. Most of them do not live where we live at uh, and uh, would not live where we live at. I'll say it that way. Uh, and a lot of them, uh, a lot of these companies are based in Virginia. Uh, some of them are based as far as India. Uh, one of the operations behind my, own, my home is owned by SR, Ener SR Energy, which is based in India. Uh, the name of the company is Fraser Creek. Uh, so yeah, they're everywhere but home. Yeah. Good evening. Thank you much, uh, so much for speaking to us tonight. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, tell us what kind of response you've got in Congress, both uh, in support and also in opposition, and what do you see um, going forward? Well, this is a whole other story. 
Hey, I testified in Congress on June the 1st, and it, I know uh, Irene asked me if I was going to bring this up, and I, I was resistant, but I will, uh, since you ask. <laughs> on June the 1st, um, I testified, I was invited to testify at a hearing. The title of the hearing was Obama's Attack on Jobs. And, and uh, I, I was like the only non co friendly person in the room. Well, uh, there was a couple other uh, congressmen that were on my side, and thank God for those two. Uh, but uh, I, I took a picture of a young lady, uh, his five year old girl uh, that lived in Kentucky. She's a, a friend of mine's daughter. And I, I had seen this picture back some time ago, and it was a young girl that was bathing in, in tea collared bath water, and it was all the water they had. And uh, she's a five-year-old girl sitting in orange bath water. And uh, the congressional representatives, Republican House Committee members is who they were, uh, Doug Lamborn and, and Doc Hastings, uh, wouldn't allow that photo to be shown. Well, I just kind of dismissed it. I was, okay, all right, you know, they don't want to look at it, so I let it go. Well, as the hearing wrapped up, uh, there was an officer come and got me by the arm and took me into the back of the courtroom and questioned me for child pornography. <laughs> so yeah, uh, they, they're willing to do just about anything to keep their evil deeds undercover. Uh, they didn't want the entire country seeing that that young lady had to bath in, in arsenic tainted orange bath water. Uh, but that's the truth. And our congressional representatives do not like it when you take the truth to them, especially the Republican Party. <laughs> During your um, campaign and your struggles, um, who have been your uh, friends and allies in terms of uh, politicians or unions? Um, and um, regional and local officials? Uh, there's very few, so it's a short list. <laughs> I, 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 actually, there's um, uh, Congressman Markey has been very helpful, uh, in, in, especially in the last year. Uh, Congressman Markey is a, is a wonderful person. Um, uh, Pallone has, has helped us with the uh, Clean Water Protection Act. We don't have a state uh, leader that would uh, that would stand up against this evil, if you will. Uh, so, it, and really, our our friends in this movement are individuals. That's our friends. That that's the people that's committed themselves. Um, and that um, America cares about what's happening in Appalachia, and the people in. In nonprofit organizations, the people in colleges, we've got more help from students in colleges than we can actually use sometimes. <laughs> we can't keep them busy. Uh, but yeah, there, there's very few political leaders that are friendly to us. So, um, but then again, I mean, we are changing the world. You're going to meet resistance. What's been the position of the uh, um, mine workers' unions? Uh, the UMWA uh, is supportive of mountaintop removal because they have union brothers that work in those operations. That, that's what I've been told by the uh, United Mine Workers of America. So they support their brothers. So it's been um, very clear through your presentation that uh, mountaintop removal has been going on for decades and so has its negative effects on the people of Appalachia. But why has it taken so long for actual change to get started? Well, it's, uh, all we had to begin with was a Winnie, a uh, Winnebago, and a van. <laughs> it took us a while. <laughs> Quite honestly, the politicians are not the ones that ordered these, these health impact, uh, the, the health studies, the health research. Uh, we, there was scientists from, from West Virginia University and Melissa Ahern is from somewhere out west. Uh, these scientists took it upon themselves to study this. And it took a long time for them to do those studies, and, and uh, it's taken a long time to get the information out. And quite honestly, uh, if we hadn't started complaining, 
the coal companies and the industry and our politicians, they would have never stepped up. They, they would have, have sat back and watched every one of us die and, and would have kept it quiet. Hi, um, my name's Kate. Um, I thank you so much for speaking thank to you. us. I feel like it's such an honor that you're here. I'm part of Environmental Issues Commission. We're a branch of central student government on campus. And I actually just saw your movie, The Last Mountain, for the first time yesterday. And um, one of the things that I really loved about it was um, towards the end of the film, a lot of people were talking about uh, alternative energy and different options that can be used in the mountains, mm -hmm. um, like wind resources. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, because I've been so frustrated, like I've watched all the presidential debates and no one's talking about energy, but everyone's talking about the economy. Yeah. And I feel like it's these economic discussions that often attack renewable energy because, you know, they talk about, well, so many jobs come from like oil and natural gas, which are, you know, natural gas and fracking is a big deal in Michigan here. And I just feel like that's really ridiculous because like you stated earlier, the future of energy and the future of our economy will be renewable. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, um, transitioning to renewable energy is, I mean, there's jobs in that, let me say that. I mean, it, it takes people. Uh, to build solar farms and wind farms and, and uh, it, quite honestly in my opinion everybody should be responsible for their own source of power just like we are for our own vehicles uh, that that um, that's one way of doing it uh, but it it, um, it we in order to have an economy we have to have an, a, a healthy economy and that's not money wise okay if we don't have healthy people a, a wealthy economy is not going to help unhealthy people so I mean we, we have to take everything into consideration here I mean because ultimately what we do or don't do right now is what affects our kids and our grandkids tomorrow so it, I mean we we have to do this and and you know um, it, just think about the options if we don't. I mean, can we really keep blowing up mountains for energy? No, we can't. Can, and, and quite honestly, like I said, USGS says we're running out of coal. So, I mean, it, it's not an option. We have to do it. And, and you know, um, <laughs> renewable energy will work. And if it doesn't, then somebody needs to rush off to, uh, uh, to well, California, for instance, uh, and let them people know that they need to take down the wind turbines because they're not working. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and you know, it, uh, we, we have to, uh, it, what we see is not, uh, is not what we should be seeing. Uh, our politicians, I'm sorry to say, but our politicians lie to us often. And, and uh, the, the renewable energy is a must. And I don't care how many Cheneys we have making money off of gas or coal or, or, or oil or nuclear in this case, uh, but they cannot continue to kill people to create energy. That's my point. Uh, we have to force our politicians to listen to us for once. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It really is an honor to have you on our campus. And I was hoping that you could perhaps share um, a story of uh, a proud moment that you've had in your own community organizing. We have tremendous leaders and community organizers on our campus. And I'm curious um, about some of your own stories and what advice you would have for them based on your experience. Um, well, I, I, I think one of the proudest moments was uh, uh, seeing a 12-year-old young man from the school stand up against the, the school system. I, I think that was quite honestly one of my proudest moments. So, yeah, the, the young people are um, 
browbeaten uh, into believing that coal is a good thing. And, and our schools are just uh, bought and paid for and by the coal industry. And uh, to see a young man stand up in, I mean, in high school is just a, a really critical place and critical time in your life anyway. But to see this 12-year-old young man stand up against the school system that was trying to browbeat him by coal uh, was an amazing moment for me. So, yeah. I wanted to return, please, to the theme that another gentleman had brought up about your friends and allies. And one thing that I was curious about were legal friends and allies. I know there's the NRDC, the National Resources Defense Council. There's undoubtedly lawyers and law students at the West Virginia University, other law schools. I'm wondering what kind of legal support you've gotten from the larger national community and also from the statewide level to help in your community, and if that's an interesting direction to go in in our conversation. Well, we have it's, uh, our legal team, can, so the main team, uh, legal team, is the Appalachian Mountain Advocates. That's uh, Joe Lovett and his group. It's an amazing group of people doing some amazing work. We also have, uh, working very closely with us, is Earth Justice, uh, Sierra Club, and uh, that public justice also. So, and yeah, this is Diane. <laughs> and and uh, quite honestly, though, that um, has been very effective. And, and it, it's been the only improvement now for, well, since the 60s. Uh, the, the coal companies have never been made to, to repair any of the damage. And, and because of our lawsuits, these companies have to uh, pay out massive amounts of money to uh, treat selenium in our streams. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi there. Um, I'm not sure if this was a question that Sean was trying to ask earlier, but um, in your experience, what has been the most effective tool or strategy that you and your organization have implemented to really initiate change and to really inform the public? I, I think it would be stories from the communities and media. Uh, uh, the media has been uh, a very important tool in this. And, and uh, working in the communities, you often hear some stories that, that just uh, really break your heart and it, you can't forget them. Uh, so what, what I do, in, once I won the Goldman Prize, it, it, I had a lot of media coming to me. Uh, so now a big part of what I do is using uh, the media to capture the stories from the other folks in the communities. And that's been a very valuable tool. Thank you so much for your story. Um, I guess in your experiences and over the years, are there some things that you've become skeptical of? Um, in, in terms of like, when, you know, when, when somebody, when, well, like if coal, coal companies are presenting themselves as sustainable or clean or, um, you know, T-Bone Pickens might be talking about natural gas and, you know, um, or B British Petroleum might be advertising themselves as beyond petroleum or something. I guess in your day-to-day -day conversations or your, your conversations with representatives or politicians, what are things that... Um, you find when uh, things that they say that you find skeptic, like that um, increases your skepticism. Or are there things that like we should look out for as organizers or as activists when somebody says something like this? Like, how do you? I guess how do you trust people? <laughs> what give you the idea? I trust people. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, it. it um, uh, Hmm. Well, I, I'm skeptical of, of a lot of things, and most usually if it's coming out of a politician's mouth, I'm extremely skeptical of it, <laughs> uh, because they always have their own agenda, uh, to, it, almost always, uh, and, they're, and they're going to build up their agenda. They're not worried about my concerns, uh, so, uh, and I, they're, only, um, uh, they're only there to pretend they're listening to us. Um, so it, I, I think I'm skeptical of, of all politicians, even the friendly ones. I, I, I wonder about them sometimes too, uh, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess I'm sort of just asking because like if, if you wanna um, 
sort of legislate change, or if you're 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 hoping that the H the House of Representatives bill might do something, you know, it seems like the in the end the way that the change is being made is through legal action. But then you you can't even trust the people that are actually passing the laws. So like I don't know, there seems to be some sort of conflict there, you know. Um. I mean, and, and I think that, I don't know, are there, are there different approaches, I guess is what I'm asking. Like, what other approaches would you um, suggest or recommend rather than working through the, the political system? Well, and it, I, I mean, I don't mean to, to downplay that. That's an important part of this yeah. work. It's an extremely frustrating part of this work. Uh, but that, that's an important part of that work. So strap on your bootstraps and get in there. You got to yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is, it's, it, it's a very frustrating uh, part of this work. It, I mean, when you talk to people and you feel like you're talking to the wall behind them, uh, that, that's very frustrating. Uh, and you, that's democracy. That's what democracy looks like. Uh, you that's know, kind of sad. Uh, so that <laughs> we, we have to do that. <laughs> and, and you know, the worst thing we can do is disconnect from that. We don't want to not do that just because it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. Because I think it is designed to frustrate everyday people. That way they don't participate in it. So, I mean, you have to do that. And it, let me say, too, that every uh, possible avenue is the avenues that we've taken. I, I don't think we've ruled anything out. Uh, we've spent a, a, a lot of time in Washington, D.C., lobbying. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in the court systems. Uh, we spend a lot of time organizing in the communities. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with the scientists, and not necessarily with the scientists, but uh, helping to gather information uh, for, for studies, we'll say it that way, uh, helping the USGS to get into in particular communities. So it, yeah, every arm of this work has brought us to this point. Uh, so there's, I, I wouldn't say that any of it, uh, I wouldn't disinclude any of it. It's important to, to take all avenues to get to that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maria, thank you for your work, which is, I think, an inspiration to everybody here. And it seems clear that, that mountaintop mining removal is a practice that, that never should have begun no. and certainly should stop now. I wonder, though, if you could talk a little bit about your state because I look at what's happening in West Virginia, uh, and I suspect that you would tell us that some of your biggest battles are with citizens of your own state. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm puzzled about why it is that a state that has suffered so much from not only mountaintop mining removal, as you've talked about, but also actually from the ravages of the coal industry over decades, would remain at least in significant part so loyal to the coal industry, and which today, you know, if you look at the sort of political landscape, it's a state that's moved from being a reliably democratic state in, in, in presidential elections to a state where the, you know, the president doesn't even have a chance. Uh, and your senator, who you showed us, uh, Senator Manchin, hasn't even, a Democrat, hasn't even said who he's going to vote for in the presidential election. <laughs> so uh, it seems like some of your worst battles may he's be undecided. at home. And I, I wonder if you might share with us how you, how you think that's possible. The people who have suffered the most are some of the strongest supporters that the coal industry draws on today. Um, I question that often myself. And, and you know, it's, uh, it, you can't, Oppressed people do not recognize that they're oppressed. That's, that's the best way I can explain that. Uh, the, um, the worst thing about being an oppressed person is you don't know anything other than oppression. So uh, you, you don't recognize that, uh, you don't recognize that it's as bad as what it is. Uh, but the people in West Virginia is, uh, not all of them, but some of them, are avid coal supporters. Uh, and then there's those that have learned those lessons the hard way. And uh, they, they can tell you how mean coal is. Uh, they, and uh, they can tell you how mean our politicians are that support that coal industry. So, um, but yeah, it, it's, hard to, um, it's hard to get an oppressed person to realize that they're being oppressed. And, and just one quick follow-up. Uh, what do you say, I mean, I mean the other, I, I su suspect another part of that dialogue, or at least effort at dialogue, um, 
uh, gets complicated because at least it, it seems at least a fair amount of people in West Virginia uh, are of the opinion that their that jobs and livelihoods depend upon the continued uh, a continued coal presence in this state. I mean, where are the you know where are the economic opportunities for people if not just mountaintop mining removal, but but the coal industry shuts down in West Virginia? And how much of a challenge is that for you and your work? It's transitioning to a renewable energy future. And let me say, too, that 86% of West Virginia citizens are anti-mountaintop removal. Uh, so it's just the, the ones that you hear and the ones that you see are the ones that's supported by the coal industry. So they like to make it look like that the state of West Virginia is supportive of mountaintop removal, but that's not true. A, a Gallup poll uh, showed that there was 86% of the people in our state against uh, blowing up our mountains for coal. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your courage and your leadership. Uh, I have a few questions for you regarding this. Uh, first of all, do these companies acquire the, the land rights to these entire mountaintops? And uh, you know, how, how are they having authority to do this, and where's the money going? Second, obviously people like yourself, your property has had terrible damage, people's health, health and lives have been destroyed, people have been displaced. And you're saying that one of the large companies is trying to rob the, the miners of their uh, health benefits and pensions. Have there been reparations and compensation for people that have suffered such great losses? Um, no, yeah, there, there's not been. And, uh, so more or less it's just driving people off the land. I'm sorry? It's just driving people off the land well, yeah, with no and, and that's, that's ultimately what the coal companies want. They, if, uh, I was told by an industry representative one time, uh, I was speaking at an occasion um, at a school, and he comes up to me after this speaking event, and he says, Maria, he says, you just don't get it. He said, if it wasn't for the need for laborers, there wouldn't be no one left living in them hills and hollers. So they, there it is. They, yes, they humans are dispensable. There. Yeah. And, and then how do they acquire the rights to such vast tracts of land and who's getting the money since uh, well, it's, it was land in common once upon a time, right? Uh, the, the, most of the land, uh, the, we'll say the mountain ridges, belong to out-of-state coal companies. Uh, and these coal companies, it, it, this land was obtained uh, during the great land grab. I don't know if folks are familiar of, with that or not. Uh, but uh, coal was discovered in uh, 1872. Uh, and uh, uh, since then, uh, the... the <laughs> Coal barons have done some really dirty deeds to obtain uh, those property rights. Uh, they, there was courthouses burnt. Uh, there was uh, people tricked out of their land. Uh, there, there was uh, uh, people that signed deeds selling off their land, had no idea what they were signing, and they just marked an X. Most of them couldn't read and write. Uh, so yeah, it was some of the dirtiest deeds in the country. Uh, in order for these industries to obtain these lands. And it, a lot of times the land is owned by out-of-state ca uh, land companies. Um, and, and the land companies lease the land to the coal companies. So the coal companies don't own the land. They only lease it. Uh, so when they get done mining it, they return it to the land companies. Except there's so much land left. That, that's not there anymore, really. I'm, I'm being sarcastic, but obviously um, huge amounts are, are leaving. There's such palpable evidence, and yet you're saying no health claims have been given credence. Is that the, is that the case, despite the studies? I, I'm that, sorry, I didn't, what was that, it? That despite the evidence of a huge impact on health and independent studies, there is no acknowledgement within the industry of any health effects due to their um, practices, is that what you were saying? Yeah, well, it, it, they won't admit it. Yeah, the, the men that work on these sites, for instance, the men that work on the mountaintop removal sites I, have bad breathing problems. There's some of them that, that have uh, uh, chemical exposure. They, they have a lot of health problems themselves. Um, but the industry is not going to, to admit that. 
They're not going to go, hey, let's stop doing this. You know, it's killing people. Uh, the people that, that are making money off of this don't live in our state. They don't care what it's doing to us. It's keeping the lights on. But there have to be huge profits that they're enjoying that obviously an impoverished re and region. And that profit is goes to Wall Street. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. Hi. I just want to say thank you again for speaking here on campus. I um, have seen the film The Last Mountain a handful of times this past year. And for me, it's really inspiring, and it really rattles me to the core. Um, so I urge everybody to check it out. It's about mountaintop removal coal mining in West Virginia. Um, and this past summer, I got the opportunity to organize in North Carolina for a week in communities outside Charlottesville where coal-fired power plants were in the backyards. And I you know, spoke with parents that had cancer and, and kids that had asthma, and uh, Duke Energy um, told the community that this one plant in particular, the Riverbend Power Plant, would be shut down by 2015, but their legal team had filed paperwork for 2020. So obviously there was an institutional um, mismatch of information that Duke Energy was portraying one side, and on the inside they were doing something else and allowing the coal power plant to stand for another handful of years. Um, and here on campus, the University of Michigan has no plan to move beyond coal or natural gas. We have a natural gas power plant on campus that supplies about half our power. The other half comes from the grid. The grid by DTE is majority coal, and we have no plan to wean off either coal or natural gas. Um, so my question to you is, with student activism and, and grassroots organizing here on campus, um, I know we will run into opposition from the university on this issue of clean energy. And I, I know that the economic, uh, the economic question will come into play that it's not feasible for us to move beyond natural gas or coal. But I want to ask you, how, how do we um, tell the story to the university that this is more than just an economic factor, this is a moral issue, this is a health issue, this is an environmental issue? So that's my question for you, thank you. Well, I, I think that it's the only right thing to do. I, I, I think um, it, it, the same as uh, the, the, well, it did, as a consumer, we'll say, as a consumer, uh, you have a, an obligation to, to buy uh, sustainable products, uh, products that don't hurt other people. And, and uh, coal is not one of those products. Coal is killing people. And you know, I, I think it would be amazing to see which university is going to lead this transition to green energy. I'd like to see which university is going to lead it. One more question. All I right. think so. Thanks. How much coal do we, how much coal does Michigan import from Appalachia? Do you think? Oh, it's, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll tell you what, if you go to ilovemountains.org, put in your zip code, it'll tell you exactly where, what mountain was blown up to supply you your electricity. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can go on the ilovemountains.org website, go to my connection link, and it will show you what mountain was blown up. And it gives you specific stories uh, of the people from the communities uh, that, that was affected by the coal that powers your homes. Hi. Hi, I, my name is Carissa. I'm actually originally from Beckley, West Virginia. Oh, okay. So I know all of this. Um, kind of two questions wrapped into one. What inspired you to take on this fight? Um, and as somebody who's moved away, I know that it's so much easier for you to move away than to fight this when it's been a major influence for you your whole life. Like you said, it's in the schools. You have friends and family that are in the industry. So what keeps you there and keeps you fighting rather than just running away, which would be the easy thing to do? Well, the, the first thing is, is this is my home. I was there long, my family was there long before coal was ever discovered. Uh, coal needs to leave, we ain't going nowhere. <laughs> and you can't run from coal, 
And anyone that believes that you can needs to educate themselves. You can't run from this. The coal leaves my backyard and travels all over the globe. How do you escape it? You can't. You have to stand and fight. This is my family. If I leave where I'm at, I abandon my family. It's not going to happen. There are other movements against modern tariff removal in other countries. Um, and I'm wondering how your uh, organization or yourself has lo have looked at that um, in the past and uh, present. It's, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable of, of uh, mountaintop removal in other countries, so I, I, I can't speak to that. So. Right, thanks. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's been so much environmental and health damage already done, like just tremendous. Your pictures are unbelievable. I'm just shocked that that's allowed to even happen. So if it stopped right now, if we got that bill passed and there was no more mountaintop removal, what's the hope of ever getting that all cleaned up? I did, well, it, um, it, it, there, there is uh, a chance that we have an opportunity to turn this around at this point. If we can't turn it around, then we're reaching the point of no turning. <laughs> so, and, and you know, quite honestly, there are jobs in repairing this damage. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the same men that destroyed it uh, can also be employed fixing it back. And not that they can fix it back, uh, just that they can't leave it the way it is. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, we, we have to do it. And, I mean, it, it has to be repaired to the best that they can do that. Uh, one, of, one of your uh, slides mentioned a, uh, a payment from... Uh, I believe one of the coal companies for several million dollars, uh, and I think it was about selenium or selenium. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about the details of that and whether that can be repeated in other parts of the state or if it might even apply to other chemicals. Also, yeah, well, uh, the selenium lawsuits has has actually been uh, some of the first ones that's ever really brought about improvement in our area and the 50 million dollars wasn't paid to the organization it was paid to the courts and that 50 million dollars is is set aside to treat selenium pollution uh, so they have to treat our water they have to improve our, our water quality in our streams uh, so that is uh, one of the only improvements that I've ever uh, known of and it was forced through the courts and the lawsuit began in 96 correct yeah so yeah, it's been in court for a long time. Will that have an effect throughout the whole state or just in one small community? It will have an effect, uh, well, it, there, it's always precedent setting, so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, and this is for uh, four outlets, four selenium pollution outlets, is, would that be correct? Yeah, for it's and treating water for selenium is extremely expensive. So $50 million is set aside to treat four streams. So, yeah, got a long ways to go. Hi, thanks again for coming. Um, I had the chance to live and work in Appalachia after college and was struck by the strength of the faith community there. I mean, there's a, a church on every street corner yeah. and some very wonderful individuals. And I knew some, some of those individuals that were working to fight mountaintop removal because of their faith, but the community as a whole was often silent. I'm wondering if you have had experience engaging the faith community and what kind of response you've gotten. Uh, well, it's, it, it varies, uh, I'll say. Uh, um, it, the faith community is a tremendous supporter of ours. Uh, and uh, the, the churches around uh, the mountaintop removal areas often get funding uh, grants or, or donations uh, from these uh, surface mining operations. At the, and even some of the men will attend the churches. They'll go to their churches and drop a, you know, 
$5,000 check and their donation plate. Well, these are small churches. They never see $5,000. And uh, so that controls the churches. It keeps them from speaking out against the industry. Uh, so they, they're, they're very uh, tactic oriented, and that's one of their tactics uh, that they um, get into the schools, they get into the churches, and they know that's the heart of the communities. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, we have a tremendous, uh, a tremendous group of faith organizations that stand with us daily. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Maria, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, um, I'd like to ask the, the last question. Uh, your hometown of Bob White is named after a uh, remarkably uh, feisty and joyful bird. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how to call a Bob White? I do. Could you do that for I us? I can. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.